You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to All About Nursing with your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. Executive Nurse Advisor Dr. Batchelor will present the significant role nurses play in providing health care in a multitude of health care settings. Listen to some of today's key nurses who work and practice in academia settings and talk about the challenges they face in today's modern medical world. So please welcome the host of All About Nursing, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. Good evening. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor, on All About Nursing, and we're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I have a very distinguished guest with me this evening, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about her. My guest is Linda Oler, who is the Associate Director for Quality, Regulatory, and Education at the New York University's Langone Transplant Institute in Manhattan. She has served on the Board of Directors for the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation and for the Washington Regional Transplant Consortium, as well as on four UNOS committees, including operations and safety. In 2001, Linda was inducted as a fellow into the American Academy of Nursing. In 2012, she received the American Society of Transplantation's Clinician of Distinction Award at ATC in Boston. In 2017, she was selected as a fellow of the American Society of Transplantation. She has lectured on transplant topics and related issues in 10 countries, including Japan, Russia, Hungary, India, England, Italy, Canada, Spain, Brazil, and Australia. She has co-written and edited four books on transplantation, which have been published in a lot of different peer-reviewed journals as well, but she's published four different books. She also served as the editor of Progress in Transplantation for 23 years. So you can see that she's got just an amazing amount of experience in in the transplant field. And again, this is another specialty that nurses work in, and I think you're going to really enjoy learning more about Linda and how she's gotten to the role she's in and what she currently is working on. So welcome, Linda. Thank you. So why don't we start with you telling the audience a little bit about like when you knew that you wanted to become a nurse? Oh, I think I was a child when <laughs> I wanted to become a nurse. <laughs> Um, but I also loved writing and, and I wanted to teach. I wanted to do everything. And guess what? Nursing let me do all of that. So I write, I teach, I edit, I, and I'm a nurse. I take care of patients. I take care of staff. I work with staff. I write policies. It, it's the best of, of the best job I could have picked, the best profession I could have picked for sure. That's wonderful. And were you influenced by anybody in your family that was in healthcare at the time? No, I was the very first nurse uh, in the family. Subsequently, um, three of my cousins have become nurses, and um, I think my bro- my brother has married a nurse. Um, so we seem to be pretty much surrounded by nurses at this particular time. But uh, none of the other family members ever went into healthcare at all. So tell us about your education pathway. How did you start in the nursing career? I actually started um, with a uh, an associate's degree in nursing, but I knew I wanted to be I wanted to be a nurse practitioner. I wanted to be a pediatric nurse practitioner. So I knew I had to go the next step. So then I went for my BSN from the associate's degree in nursing, and then from my BSN I went. I, I worked in critical care during my schooling. While I was going to school for um, for my um, bachelor's degree, I worked on weekends. And then when I went for my master's, I did the same thing. I worked on the weekends. I did the 12-hour shifts on the weekends. And my master's is in cardiovascular nursing. 
uh, from Catholic University. And I thought I wanted to be a nurse practitioner for pediatrics, but decided once I got into that role, into the pediatric role, I cried all the time. Mm-hmm. I cried when a little boy was going down to have his tonsils out. I cried when another child came in with a broken arm, and I decided, you know what? I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. So I stayed in the adult world. It's funny you should say that because um, I found that probably the hardest specialty as well for the same kind of reasons that you described. And uh, I figured that I'd probably be in trouble if I tried to work in that area. But that's the great part about nursing is we have so many different people that have lots of different likes and dislikes. So it's awesome. So tell us a little bit about how you got to transplantation because it's quite a specialty. It is. Um, It's really interesting how I got into it because I was teaching at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. I was teaching graduate school um, and I was teaching in the cardiovascular nursing program where I had graduated. And one of my students, um, two of them, one worked at Johns Hopkins, the other one worked at Inova Fairfax, and they were both going to be leaving the area, but they both worked in heart transplantation. And they had to write a paper. And I was reviewing the paper, and I'm going, oh, my God, this is so fascinating. So I started asking them more questions about it. The one who was leaving, um, her husband was a physician, and they were going to be moving to Boston. So she asked me if I'd be interested in covering for the summer until they found a replacement for her. So the summer, I didn't have a job. I mean, we don't teach in the summer in grad school anyway. We didn't. So I went ahead and um, worked for her for the summer, but I fell in love with what I was doing. I was working with patients again, and it was wonderful. I had the best time, and these patients were so interesting. They had been through so much, so near death, and then they got a heart transplant, and they were leading a relatively normal life. I mean, they had a lot of medications to take, but they were playing baseball. They were playing tennis. They were doing things that everyone was doing, and I thought, this is a life-changing uh, position when they get their heart transplant. they just It's life-changing. So I became totally involved in this, and I resigned my position and took the job as the transplant coordinator for the heart transplant program at Inova Fairfax. And I have loved every minute of my job, most most of the time. I have to say there were some downfalls every once in a while, <laughs> but <laughs> definitely some downfalls once in a while. But I really loved what I was doing, and I still do. I'm still in it. And now it's been since 1986, uh, no, 87, that I've been in heart transplantation, and I still love it. I've worked in lung, ventricular assist devices. I helped set up a liver transplant program and a kidney transplant program. I've I've done so many different jobs, but working with the patients is one of the best, just to see those lives changed the way they, they are. And you've had a so that's wonderful how I got into transplant. Yeah, and, and you've had a I'm wonderful sorry. opportunity to see how they really as you just started to describe how their lives really transform and and how great they go on to then be feeling um, after they've had the transplant. That's I would assume how that's really made you so uh, excited about continuing in the in the field. Exactly, and and I as I said, I love teaching, and here I was teaching patients about the transplant. And if they felt a little bit timid about even going that route because it didn't sound right to them, it didn't feel right, they didn't know anybody who had ever had a heart transplant. I would get one of the other patients to come and talk to them too. So I would do the teaching, but I wasn't as experienced as someone who had gone through this. So I would have the two of them meet, and that really helped them understand. They could ask somebody who had been there and done that. So all the teaching I did was great. They got to learn what their life might be like from me, but they got to learn what their life would be like from someone who actually had been there. That's awesome that you were able to do that, Linda. Yeah, it was very exciting to work with the patients, and I learned so much from them. I learned about them, what we take a marriage vow that says in sickness and in health. Awesome. 
Well, this is all about nursing. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor. We're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And right now, it's time for us to take a short break. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale. An international initiative called Nursing Now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing, Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. WikiWags brings harmony back into your home for male dogs and their owners. Inventor and entrepreneur Linda Jangula has created the disposable doggy diaper wraps made with the male dog in mind. The built-in wicking ability prevents rashing and other potential health issues for your dog. Each wrap comes in four sizes and has dual reattachable magic tabs for easy adjustments. And each size has a 7-inch logo strip for adjustability. So they are comfortable and easy to use. No more fuss, just leave the mess to us. Whether you're in or out, your dog will be free to run about. Stop cleaning and start enjoying your home, and you can even leave your dog alone. To order your WikiWags, visit wikiwags.com, or to find out where to buy WikiWags in your town, visit mywikiwags.com and start enjoying having man's best friend around. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to All About Nursing, live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm Dr. Joyce Batcher, the host of the show, and I have a very distinguished guest with me this evening, who is Linda Oler, who serves as the Associate Director for Quality, Regulatory, and Education at the New York University's Langone Transplant Institute, Manhattan. And prior to the break, Linda was telling us about how she got into transplant nursing and just how much she thoroughly enjoys it. I want to share with the audience that I used to work with Linda when you started talking about setting up the kidney, kidney pancreas, and liver transplant program. I was working with Linda at the time, and I could not have done it without her amazing expertise. And so I always thoroughly enjoyed watching the physicians defer to Linda's judgment since she really had has had, I mean, just an incredible amount of experience. And uh, so I just wanted to recognize it and, and say that. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more, Linda, about, you know, because you've been in this field for quite a number of years, what you really continue to feel so uh, passionate and satisfying. Oh, wow. So many things, too. And if I could just say one thing, that when I was working as a transplant coordinator at that first position and Joyce came into my life as my manager. She was the first person who understood what we were doing. And it was so nice to have somebody that got it. It was great. But you had that critical care background, too. So that really was helpful. So thank you. I was so glad you were there. Thank you very much. But anyway, um, what kept me here? What has kept me so long? Well, seeing the lives changed is one thing. But the variety that I get, too, it's a lot of opportunities. Like I said, I was heart, lung. I did ventricular assist devices. I've worked with the total artificial heart. I mean, that's an amazing thing, too. Um, so I've had so many opportunities to work in different areas of transplant, setting up programs. And from that, I went into consulting, too. And I want to tell you a little bit about that because with all the experiences that I've had, I've worked in every organ system. I worked at NIH where we were doing research trying to develop um, tolerance studies so the patients didn't have to take all these medications afterwards to suppress their immune system. So we were doing some tolerance studies. Obviously, it didn't work because none of us are there anymore. But we tried and we learned a lot. But unfortunately, we didn't develop the tolerance. But just having that opportunity and, and working in every organ system, uh, including 
islet cells and kidneys and livers and intestines. So I've worked in just about every one of those. So as a consultant, it was really helpful when I went to some of these hospitals that were in trouble with um, with the regulators because their maybe their volume wasn't good enough of transplants, maybe their outcomes weren't good enough. And that's when quality came into the um the equation so that we had to meet certain quality outcomes and most of us have never had classes in quality in school we didn't learn that but I had taken some postgraduate quality courses so I was really excited to be able to start applying that knowledge to some of my colleagues in different states I was in Utah I was in Ohio I was in Tennessee I was in Florida so I was working with all of these different programs to help them learn about quality and how to apply it, the pre-transplant, perioperative, post-transplant, discharge, all of those things I was learning and I was teaching my colleagues how to do that and how to establish a program um, that would be a high quality type of program. Putting safety in that too. Safety was another part of the equation when you're looking at quality because you look at areas that maybe aren't going so well. So now you drill down and find out why so that you can make that area better. So that has been a a real new exciting area for me is to not only be in transplant but to be looking at the quality area, aspects of transplantation, looking at what's not going right and how to make it look better because you have to drill down, find a way to fix it and make it get safer and better for our patients. So that has been great. And that's something I've been teaching in Brazil. Um, I've been there four times now helping the nurses, and I teach online with them sometimes too, that I actually am teaching them how to apply and collect data and, and track data. So that has been really exciting for them as well. They're now writing papers on quality, and they're implementing quality programs in Sao Paulo. So that has been really exciting for me to be able to see. So the not just the patient care, but making sure that the patients get the best care by applying these quality measures and performance measures that we can all follow, but teaching the nurses and teaching the physicians and teaching all of the members of the multidisciplinary transplant team about quality because, as I said, it isn't something that has been taught in school. So it, I think it is now. It's added to the curriculum, but it wasn't when I went to school and not when most of my colleagues went to school. So I really like that piece of it. And I think it's important for our audience that's listening, that's a lay audience, to know that what you're talking about in terms of the quality and being held to certain kinds of outcomes is a good thing because uh, the, there's actually a lot of oversight that if there are places where there's trouble in terms of outcomes that they're seeing that are not good, there's more intentional inspections done in those organizations. So I think that's something that people should feel reassured is that you know we are being held to those kinds of improvements. And, uh, and I think that you also mentioned this is a an area where, for sure, the interdisciplinary team has got to work together. And so that's great that you were able to share all that, Linda. I was curious. I you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I said I love doing that. I love teaching, um, as I said. And so going into the multidisciplinary team to bring in the infectious disease docs so that they help us decide what we may need to follow because we might have a episode of C. difficile going on in the hospital. So how do we fix that? How do we track it? How do we make it so that we're not going to get, have any other patients get that disease so that they don't get that particular problem? So you, you start tracking those things and it's really very exciting. So we work with the infectious disease doctors as well as with the transplant surgeons and the transplant physicians. And we work with all of our colleagues who are mostly nurses, social workers, pharmacists. It's such a multidisciplinary team and that's really interesting. We learn so much from each other. But teaching all of them about quality has been really important too. Having quality meetings every other month or quarterly or once a month even, um, having these meetings where you actually drill down. So it's more than doing M&M rounds. It's going, because M&Ms, you just kind of talk about the 
what happened in quality you're looking at what happened and trying to fix something that may be the root cause of what happened so it really is better for patients in terms of the outcomes great uh, we are coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is all about nursing. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, and we'll continue this conversation when we come back. Dr. R.C. will share extraordinary resources and services that promote educational success, as well as making a difference in the lives of all social workers, as well as the lives of children, adolescents, and teens of today. She will have open discussions addressing many of the issues that we face about our youth and how being employed in the uniquely skilled profession of social work for over 18 years has taught invaluable lessons through her personal experiences. She will also provide real life facts, examples, and personal stories that will confirm that why serving as a child advocate is extremely beneficial when addressing the needs of the whole child. Listen live Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio as Dr. RC will provide thought provoking information that will empower, encourage, and strengthen students, families, and communities across our nation. You can also visit her at soarwithkatie.com. Global Glory, that's the work of Dr. Marina McLean, COO of Global Glory, whose calling is to serve God. A first-generation British-born Londoner of Jamaican descent, Dr. McLean inherited the hunger for the word from her father, who was a Bible teacher. Growing up, her home was filled with missionaries from the Caribbean islands and America, and she travels the world preaching the gospel. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Theology and an Honorary Doctorate of Divinity and Christian Counseling from Friends International Christian University. Dr. McLean is also a songwriter and recording artist, and her songs are written during summits and conferences in the presence of God. She's recorded three worship albums to date and is in ministry for 28 years alongside her husband, Dr. Rennie McLean, who shares her passion. Visit www.globalglory.org or on Facebook at Global Glory. Call 866-244-5679 and feel the glory. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing. We're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And before the break, my guest, Linda Oler, who is the Associate Director for Quality, Regulatory, and Education at the New York University's Langone Transplant Institute in Manhattan, was telling us a, a lot about the transplant specialty area that she currently works in, how long she's been in the, that specialty, and the great work that she's been leading and helping to teach others around quality and uh, that kind of outcomes organizations are held to. And so you may want to talk a bit more about that, Linda. I wanted to make sure we gave you adequate time for that because I know there's a lot that you do in that arena. Exactly. Because transplant is high cost, high risk involved with those things, then we have um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, CMS, um, has some oversight. And that came into fruition uh, 2007. They put out the conditions of participation for transplant programs. So we are one of the most highly regulated areas now. We have UNOS, the United Network for Organ Sharing, and they have standards of care that we must follow. And then we have CMS, or Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, which has um, standards that we must follow, too. So they have guidelines for us, and then we develop policies based on those, and that's where we have to make sure that we are following these policies. Uh, we just had a UNOS vis- site visit um, in October last year, um, and they come in and they make sure that we are following these things. And this is all about patient safety. Every single one of these things is based on something to do with patient safety. So whether it's CMS or uh, Medicare or whether it's uh, it's UNOS, we're always looking at the safest things. So like I said, because we're high risk and because we're um, high cost, it requires a lot of oversight. Sometimes it's overwhelming. But it's for the better of of the program and the better for the patient um, altogether. So it's been good. It's been frustrating. I'm one of the few people, I'm probably one of, uh, I'm probably the only one in the United States that actually likes the regulations. I like them because it gives me structure in setting up a program, in working with programs that have fallen short of their goals, of the standard goals from CMS or UNOS. I love working with those people to help them develop 
into a better program using policies and making sure that everyone is following those policies. Um, so when you have these site surveys, when they come in every two or three years, they come into your center and they stay for anywhere from two to five days. And they go through everything, every document. They look at papers. They look at policies. They want to make sure that you are following those policies. They follow the team around. They want to see when you do multidisciplinary rounds with the patients. They go with you because they want to see how does that team interact and how does it document what they've decided for the plan of care. How does the social worker react to that plan of care? How does the pharmacist react to that plan of care? How do they then implement what's being done? How does it affect their care and, and their vision for um, preparing this patient to go home? And I like to say preparing the patient for self-care. That's what we're going to be doing. When we're getting the patients ready to go home, we are preparing them for self-care. We prepare the, the family and as any support person that they have, and we prepare the patient to take care of him or herself. One of our physicians had a heart transplant last year here at Langone. And mm. it was really interesting what he says now after this experience. He is himself as a transplant surgeon. He goes around the country talking about it. And he said the most difficult thing was keeping all of the medications straight. And he's an MD, PhD. So wow. if he's an MD, PhD, imagine what it's like for our patients with even less than a high school diploma. So we have to really structure our teaching in a way that it's simplified, but it's also structured. And he said keeping all of those medications straight has just been one of the most difficult things for him at first. He said it was really scary to try to think, did I take that medicine? So he had to learn to use the pill box. So he has taught us a lot from his perspective about what it was like. He said there were two things that he learned afterwards. One is how amazing nurses are, and two is how to take care of all those medications and get those all straight. So he was so amazed at the nurses in the ICU and the nurses in the step-down unit and the teaching that he got to go home from the pharmacist, from the nurses. He said the thing that he learned the most with those two things was getting straight all the medications and the newly formed respect that he had for nurses and nursing care. So that was really exciting. I got goosebumps when he said that. So that was pretty exciting to hear him. So preparing patients to go home, you're preparing somebody either without not even a high school education or somebody with an MD, PhD, somebody, anybody, it doesn't matter. They have the same needs. They need to understand all of these medications. And the medications, there's probably 20 that they have to take afterwards. And sometimes it's $1,500 a month. So we have to make sure that they have the insurance coverage and things like that. So another person on our, on our uh, multidisciplinary team is the financial coordinator that makes sure that they have the coverage for all of these things as well. So, Linda, when they're going to get ready to go home, is is there also an assessment of what home is like? Because not everybody lives in the same kind of home. I was just curious if you could say a little bit about that. kind of goes with how do you make sure you have the money that is going to pay for the medications that you're going to need for the rest of your life. Exactly, exactly. Um, yes, that's exactly right. And the home environment is very, um, very important. Yes, here in New York, um, we have a lot of homes that are up high. <laughs> and so some of them don't always have elevators in them, so somebody might have to walk up four flights of stairs before they get up to their apartment. So, yes, these are things that we find out before they're transplanted. These are things that the social workers get into before we even start. So they look not only at the psychosocial support system that the patient's going to have, but they look at their environment, too. We had a patient um, at another when I was in um, the Washington, D.C. area working. We had a patient who didn't have running water so and had well water. Well, we had to get that well water tested 
to make sure mm-hmm. it didn't have any bacteria or anything in it that the patient might have a reaction to. So these are things that we have to think about when we're discharging a patient as well. Absolutely. That's awesome. Uh, we are coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is all about nursing. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, host of the show, and we'll be back after a short break. French Rastafarian baker Chef Hugues Mott is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Chef Uvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Uvmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefoub.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. The opiate epidemic has reached crisis levels, and with so many families affected by addiction, opiate-related drug overdoses, and death, the time is now to have a real constructive conversation about addiction that could lead to better prevention, treatment, and recovery. Alan Charles, author and keynote speaker on drug abuse and prevention, presents The Alan Charles Show. Alan brings a message of hope, sharing his unbelievable story of surviving a 24-year addiction to cocaine and and highlights from his memoir, Walking Out the Other Side, an addict's journey from loneliness to life. His raw honesty and courageous heart breaks the stigma of addiction and offers a unique perspective into the mind of an addict. Join Alan each week as he brings his listeners to a true understanding of the grip of addiction. It is only with this understanding that we can begin to heal. The Alan Charles Show, Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network. You are listening to All About Nursing live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, the host of the show, and I have my guest this evening is Linda Oler, who is the Associate Director for Quality, Regulatory, and Education at the New York University's Langong Transplant Institute Manhattan. And Linda's been sharing just so much wonderful information about her experiences and the kind of work she does in this specialty that has just been delightful to learn more about. I thought it might be helpful because you had mentioned earlier about where the technology is going and, you know, organ donation is so important and uh, and I, and yet we know that there are not enough organs being donated to meet all of the needs of the people that have, um, that are on the list waiting for different donations. And so technology, the, you mentioned the LVAD and the artificial heart, maybe you could just share a little bit about where all that has come to because I know there's just been huge advances. Very much so. Yes, uh, the left ventricular assist device, right ventricular assist device, total artificial heart, that's really transformed um, our, our health care for, for sure. Patients would die waiting for heart transplants because there just weren't enough available. There was more of a demand. Once we found, when they first did, did the first heart transplant, Christian Bernard, as you know, did that back in 1968 um, after he studied at VCU by the way. He learned how to do them at VCU. And then the next heart transplant was done at Stanford University by um, Dr. Um, Shumway. So there just weren't enough hearts to go around. People weren't donating. I mean, that was kind of unusual to hear about donating a heart or donating lungs. So it was something the public had to get used to and start learning more about and meeting somebody who had had a heart transplant. But because we couldn't make that happen, people were dying. We wanted to stop, find a way not to have them die. What can we do? We had balloon pumps. We had electronics of, of some kinds, like with uh, to prevent the heart from fibrillating. We had defibrillators and we had um, pacemakers. But we needed something for that left ventricle. When that left ventricle can't pump the blood out, that's when people run into trouble. When it can't get that blood down to the kidneys, can't get it up to the brain, people start having comorbidities and things. So someone came up with the idea of putting a pump in the left ventricle and then having it go down into the abdomen and then up to the aorta. So they had tubing 
that came out of the left ventricle so that the blood went straight through the left ventricle and down into a artificial left ventricle. At the time that when they first came out, they were made of titanium. And it was probably about four or five inches around. And it would lay in the abdomen and it would do the pumping. And then there was tubing that went up to the aorta that actually pumped it out to the aorta so that the system, this saved lives. And this was called a bridge to transplant. So we would put people on this and they could walk around with it. They could eventually go home on it. And now it's over the shoulder and people wear it all the time and, and you don't even know they've got it on. So th this has been a lifesaver for patients who with heart failure and, and severe heart diseases. So you put this in and they can be years on these things several years waiting for a heart transplant or deciding, you know what, this is all I want. I'm just going to keep this in. So they might have to replace it after a couple of years and the patient goes on. So that has been a true, true lifesaver. We don't have anything like that for lungs yet, um, but we're getting there. Um, the ECMO machine, which when I was in the ICU and working with ECMO, it wasn't like at all like it is today. Now we have an ECMO machine and the patients are on ECMO. It's like a, um, it's almost like a perfusion machine in the operating room. So it keeps people alive that need a lung transplant. We can use it for heart transplant too, but usually we're using it mostly with our lung patients that need um, a lung transplant, a double lung transplant. So they actually get up and walk around they can't go out of the hospital yet. We're not right. there yep. yet. But the work that we've done so far with the left ventricular assist device has been wonderful. And we can even do a total artificial heart now. You can take the whole heart out and put a plastic heart in there, and it pumps and keeps people alive. And they can go home on that as well. So technology has come a long way for hearts. It's coming a long way for lungs. We've got a ways to go yet for liver. We've got dialysis for the kidney. Um, but we, we still are trying to find artificial means of keeping people alive so that um, they can get a transplant or use that as a, as a destination therapy, so to speak, so that they'll stay on that for the rest of their lives. And do you have several people that really do decide to, to stay with the left ventricular assist device because it's giving them a good quality of life and they just want to keep it as is? Yeah, exactly. We do, um, and that's usually a choice that sometimes we make and sometimes they make. For instance, okay. they um, and you might remember Vice President, the former Vice President of the United States, Cheney. He actually was on a left ventricular assist device for a white time, quite a time. And at first, it was going to be destination therapy because he was, I think, 71, 72 years old, and he decided he was just going to do that. And then he decided he wanted to go for the heart transplant, and he did. He got a heart transplant, and he's done quite well. I think he's now maybe six, seven years post-heart transplant, so he's done very well. One of my patients is now 34 years post-heart transplant. Wow. She's done well. You may remember her. Uh, yeah, you may, may remember her when you were uh, my boss. Yeah, she's done very, very well. And what I'd like to talk about, too, at the transplant games, these patients that get a heart transplant – or get a liver transplant or get a kid. We have games. They're going to be in uh, New Jersey this year, uh, in July of this year. They're going to be at the Metal Meadowlands in New Jersey. So we're getting our patients all ready so that hearts will compete against livers, compete against kidneys, <laughs> and they put them according to age groups. It's a lot of fun. We have thousands of people that come, and it shows how transplant works. They have tennis. They have swimming. They have biking. They have running. And then they have table tennis, and then they have card games. So for people who aren't quite up to doing all of those things, they can actually compete with card in card games. We have ballroom dancing. People can compete in ballroom dancing. It's really exciting for the patients to show how well transplant works. And it, they, it was held in Houston two years ago, and I forget how many millions of people signed up to be organ donors after seeing wow. something like this, when you can awesome. see. How, so one of our goals this year is to beat Houston, okay? That's awesome. We're going to try to beat the record that they had for getting the number of patient people signed up for organ donation. 
That's awesome. Um, this is all about nursing, and I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. We're live on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio, and right now it's time to take a short break. The earliest human societies worshipped a female goddess. Little is known about this time because we did not always have a written recorded history. It was around 3100 B.C. when the Sumerians invented the first written language, and everything that preceded this time is prehistory. The prehistorical record includes all of women's unwritten history from 30,000 B.C. to the time that men began achieving political power around 3,000 B.C. Male feminist artist Kimberly Berg maintains a strong position in educating and inspiring both men and women through his devotional art to the goddess in all women. Studying their history is paramount to understanding who women were and who they would become later living in a patriarchal society. To learn more about this important time in our history, go to www.isisrising.net. Master of words, powerful player. What life-changing words can Dr. Janet Smith Warfield pull out of her magical toolbox that just might mysteriously open a door you never knew was there? A door to free yourself from fear forever. Transform your rage into right action. Release your guilt. Position you into a life of freedom, purpose, passion, power, and peace. All quite suddenly, unexpectedly, and almost miraculously, with no effort on your part. Join Dr. Janet every Monday at noon Eastern on Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom. On the BBM Global Network, as she and her guests show you how words map our experiences immersing you in a sound bath that relaxes your muscles, opens your mind, and supports you in co-creating your extraordinary life. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to All About Nursing, live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, the host of the show. And just before the break, my guest, Linda Oler, who, as you probably have been hearing, has just tremendous experience in the field of transplantation, was telling us about the transplant games that are being are going to be held in um, New Jersey in July, and they have a goal which is to beat Houston, uh, which had I guess uh, you said like over like a million people that were signing up to be organ donors as a result of seeing the kind of impact organ donation can have. So maybe you'd like to share a little bit more about that with everyone. Yes, it, I think some of the games are televised, you know, in the news reports and things like that, it's in the newspapers. And, I mean, thousands of people go to this. Living donors participate, livers, kidneys, children participate. It, you you are in uh, games according to your age group. So they'll have like 20 to 30, um, uh, 31 to 40, that kind of thing. So it's in age groups. And then you compete, but it's, like I said, it's hearts against kidneys, against livers, against lungs. It's really great. Bone marrow um, is is in wow. this year too, as well as living donors. So it's really, really um, exciting to 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 see them do this. So we're going to participate. And uh, NYU is a magnet hospital, and so what we're going to be doing is a lot of our nurses are going to volunteer over there at the game since it's cl- so close this year. Um, so not only are we going to beat Houston with the number of people that become organ donors, but we're going to have nurses there that, you know, can get their, um, because of the, the work they'll be doing from a um, volunteering point of view, which is what Magnet asks, you know, wants us to do. They want us to be doing some volunteering in the community. So we're going to be doing that over there. So a lot of our ICU nurses and transplant nurses are going to be going over to the games we're preparing the patients with our physical therapy department working with them. I was at a meeting in Philadelphia last week, and I challenged the University of Philadelphia to just try and beat us. So we're going to have <laughs> NYU versus the University of Pennsylvania while we're there. So we're going to uh, compete against their heart and lung transplant program. One of my heart recipients from 25 years ago, um, I keep in touch with him, and he has won. He has played in eight different games over the 25 years. He has played, he has gone to winter games because he was a ski instructor before. So wow. he has won medals in the ski and he gave his medals to his donor family. Wow. Oh my gosh. There wasn't a dry eye in the place when he did that. He took them off from around his neck 
and he put them over the mother. And he said, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have been able to win these. So they're for you. It was beautiful. And the, the mother cried. I cried. Um, it was a very touching scene. So it means a lot to the donor families, too. You know, that another thing I'm thinking about is every year there is the Rose Bowl Parade. And every year in the Rose Bowl Parade, there is the Donate Life float. And one year, about five years ago, I asked for my Christmas present to be a round-trip ticket to Los Angeles so I could help build that float. It was amazing to put those roses in the and flowers in the float. And you donated a flower to someone who had been a donor. And I donated a girlfriend of mine, son. Um, was killed in an auto accident and I donated a flower to him and it's all these donor families are there I met so many people who were so excited to be able to help build this donate life float um, and you go down it won first prize this year so we won a prize that year too but not like this year was really amazing every year it gets more and more amazing so when you're watching the Rose Bowl parade and you see that donate life float it is amazing, the people that have worked on that, the donor families, the living donors, the um, recipients that have done it. And a lot of the universities, transplant centers in the Los Angeles and, and San Diego area helped build it, too. And I, it was one of the best things that I've done in my life. I loved doing that. It was amazing. I told my husband, we have to go back and do it again. It really does symbolize a lot of love because it's it's got to be hard for the donor families when they lose their loved ones, but it's got to be great to see that they've really been able to benefit someone else. It's uh, it's definitely a, a, a challenging field at times. I, I know you do a great yeah. job with it. You know, your depth and your breadth of impact, when I look at four books on transplant and you've done a lot of interpreting so that it's they're using these in other countries and... You know, uh, how do you do all that, Linda? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, fortunately, I don't require a lot of sleep, but we do. We're Sandy and I, my um, my right, author partner and I are writing an, uh, another book now, and we're just talking to different publishers. We did transplantation cir nursing secrets, and nurses use them to study with, and then we did the core curriculum for transplant nurses. That's in the second edition now. But we're going to do the second edition of Transplant Secrets. Um, we've done two other books together as well. Um, one of the things that I, I love is that these books are used to get the certification. Sandy and I then also go around the country and teach certification courses to nurses to help them prepare for the certification exam. Your nursing school teaches you to be a generalist or master's program you, you specialize. But when you're certified, that shows that you're really focused in one area. So I'm focused in transplant, I'm certified in transplant, and I want to help others become that as well. I also have mentioned that I love writing. And when I was editor, I ran out of things to write about from letter from the editor. I was like, what else can I write about now? So I started interviewing some of the great men and women in transplant. I interviewed Dr. Starzl. I interviewed Dr. Lauer, who did one of the first heart transplants in Virginia, the first heart transplant in the state of Virginia. And he studied with Dr. Shumway, who did the first one in the United States. And he actually taught Christian Bernard how to do them. So um, he was one of my first in courage and character leaders and legends because they are courageous to be doing this. They are character and they are leaders and they are legends. So I have done 37 of these. I'm doing women in transplantation, too, women surgeons. I'm doing those. I did the first black female surgeon. I did uh, the first face transplant uh, surgeon for the United States, Dr. Simonow. I interviewed her. So it has been an amazing experience to be able to talk to these people and capture their thoughts while they're still alive. Instead of having writing about them posthumously, I'm doing it while they're alive. So it's been really exciting to be able to do that. 
That's wonderful. And uh, we can talk a bit more about that when we come back. Uh, this is all about nursing. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. We're live on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And uh, we'll continue this conversation in just a little while. Hello, I'm Steve Fagan, and I'm president and CEO of Fagan Associates, but I'm also a life coach. I'm here to help you reach your dreams, goals, and objectives. As a life coach, it's my job to be your support, to be your teammate, to help you understand what is your dream, what is your life passion, and then together we work as that team to help you reach your specific goals. Life is worth living the best you can be. Working with a life coach, you're fulfilling those dreams and goals is your passion, and it's your way of living. Let me help you do that today. Let me help you really reach the best that you can be as a person and live the life you should be living. I'm Steve Fagan. I'm a life coach, and I'm here for you. Contact Steve Fagan at FaganAssociatesInc.com or call 1-800-239-2701. And I'll be glad to help you move forward to live the life of success. Reach your dreams, your goals, your objectives. We can do it together. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale, an international initiative called Nursing Now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing, Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Global Network. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor, on All About Nursing, and we're live on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And Linda uh, has been sharing just phenomenal information about the specialty of transplantation this evening with us. And I was really mesmerized as you were talking about interviewing 37 different key leaders physicians and um, others in the field of transplant. And as you started describing that, um, you know, there may be a little bit more you want to say about that. I also was curious if you could tell us like where those stories are printed, because I would imagine they would be extremely inspirational to read. They are fun. Um, I wrote them as when I was the editor for Progress and Transplantation. So they are in there and I'm the group has, when I, um, resigned as editor after 23 years to give myself a couple of weekends off, um, the new editor asked me to continue writing them. So I did one. Um, I've, I've done several of them since I've, um, re- since I've no longer been editor. So I'm still publishing them, but I'm focusing on women. But it's interesting. Uh, we just did the first um donor after circulatory death heart transplant that was done in the United States anyway. They've been doing them in Australia and and in Europe, but we just did the first one here last week. So I'm interviewing the surgeon that did that. And, but I've also interviewed Dr. Shumway's daughter. Um, He was the first person to do a heart transplant in the United States out in, at Stanford. But his daughter is a heart and lung transplant surgeon at the University of Minnesota. And I interviewed her last year. Yeah, I know. It's really exciting. It was fun interviewing her because, like, she was saying, you know, what? because I said, how much did your father influence you? And obviously he he did. So interviewing her was really interesting because she does heart and lung transplants. But I'm going to... I've already done her interview. I've written it up, but it's not published yet because I'm going to usurp it with this exciting news that we did a DCD heart transplant um, this past week. So I'm interviewing that surgeon, and that'll go in the next issue. But progress in transplantation. If you go into Google and do uh, courage and character leaders and legends, they will come up right on the Google, and you'll get to see some of the things that I learned about some of these amazing people. It was really interesting. I interviewed one of the surgeons here 
and he's really out on the forefront. He's always speaking in Europe or Australia or someplace, and he's all over the place. And when I interviewed him, one of the things I found when I always read about them first, I get as much information on what they've written themselves or what has been written about them. And his fourth grade teacher said, Bobby thinks rules aren't for him. And I thought to myself, that's interesting. That's interesting because that's a surgeon, isn't it? Yes, so it they're is. always kind of pushing the envelope. So even in fourth grade, he was pushing the envelope. And he's a very famous and well done. I mean, he's an amazing surgeon. Um, he does some amazing stuff and a lot of great research that has moved us forward in the field of kidney transplantation using ABO incompatible donors and um, high, highly sensitized patients. So he's, we've learned an awful lot from him with his research. So I thought that was interesting that she, his fourth grade teacher noticed that rules were not for him. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So Linda, so were there these, were there other themes that you kind of heard as you talked to all these people that you learned from? Um, they're mo they're mostly surgeons, mostly, but I did quite a few nurses too. By the way, I interviewed some of the first transplant coordinators and um, some of the things that they did. But I've been looking for themes. They're all characters. They okay. all are characters, and they all have a lot of courage. They're like pushing things forward all the time, every one of them that I talked to. They were doing something on the forefront. They wanted to push, and that's exactly what that teacher said. The rules aren't for him. So, a, And that's kind of the way it is with surgeons. You do have to remind them that there are some rules. But they're good. They're very good. They're always looking for better ways to do something. So it's it's great. They've done a lot for for our patients in heart transplant, lung transplant, kidney, intestines. We're doing them all. Thank you so much, Linda. It has been wonderful having you on the show. You have given us a really great depth of understanding about the specialty of transplant and nursing and the amazing role that uh, that you've been in, having on the um, in this arena and continue to have. So thank you again for being with us. You all have been listening to All About Nursing live from the BVM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, the host of this show, and I hope that you'll tune in again next week. Thank you. You've been listening to All About Nursing with your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. Tune in each week and get a daily dose of nursing and the healthcare services they provide and how nurses are finding innovative ways to address the key healthcare issues they're facing today here on Dr. Joyce Batchelor's All About Nursing. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.